Hello for everyone that is joining. Welcome to this WSET Global webinar on what are Australia's main wine regions. I can see people just joining now, but we've got a lot to get through. So let me just do some introductions really briefly. Um, first to say, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, we are the world's leading provider of qualifications and courses in wines, spirits, and sake. We have over 50 years experience in designing and delivering education to help wine professionals and consumer enthusiasts learn more about wines, spirits, and sake. Um, and you can take our qualifications in many countries, uh, in over 70 countries, in fact, provided by a network of over 800 course providers. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about our courses, uh, please go to wsctglobal.com to find your nearest course provider. But that is the introduction spiel out of the way. Um, just a reminder that uh, this is being recorded and it will be available to watch on the WSCT Global Events Hub, which you can find on YouTube. And if you have any questions at all through the course of the webinar, please put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, and we'll have a bit of time at the end to cover that. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Sam Povey. I am an educator working for the WSET School in London. Uh, so I teach level one, two, and a little bit of three in wine. And I'm really looking forward to talking about Australia because it's one of my favorite countries. So let's dive right in by having just a really brief look at the history of Australian wine. So the great variety the grapevine is not native to Australia. It was brought over to Australia by European colonists in the sort of late 17th century, early 18th uh, century, uh, particularly the first fleet, as it was called, um, which was captained by Arthur Philip, brought over vines. They planted them near Botany Bay in Sydney. As it turned out, it was actually um, much too warm uh, and humid. So that first experiment wasn't particularly successful. But over the course of the early 1800s, vines were planted throughout large parts of Australia, particularly in the south of the country. And in fact, some of those early vines planted in the 1840s, 1850s, they still remain, they're still growing, and they're still producing wine in some rare cases. Fast forwarding a little bit to the kind of end of the 18th century to the 1890s, and there's quite a lot of wine being made in Australia, but not as we know it today. So going back to about 1890, near enough 90%, so nine out of every 10 bottles of wine produced in Australia was fortified wines. Um, and while some of these were quite good quality, they probably bear very little resemblance to the styles that we're used to today. Although there is record of a Syrah or Shiraz wine uh, being from grown in Victoria, being shown at the 1878 Paris exhibition and journalists likened it to Chateau Margaux, which is a, who are a very famous producer from Bordeaux. So clearly some good quality wine being produced even back then. Um, around about the beginning of the 1900s, a lot of wine regions fall into um, disrepair or are entirely abandoned um, for a range of sort of socioeconomic reasons. But there's a turning point in the 1950s, particularly the arrival of lots of German and Italian immigrants um, many of whom came from wine growing regions in, uh, in back in Europe, bringing with them lots of expertise and innovation. And the result being that the quality and quantity of wine being produced in Australia increased quite a lot. And in particular, they switched to the production of what we would call table wines, basically non fortified styles of wine. And that set the stage for the export boom in the 1980s. So since the 1980s, the amount of wine produced and exported to the rest of the world in Australia has increased massively. So to give you some statistics, and we won't be too numbers heavy, but just to give you a couple um, of numbers. In 1981, Australia exported 8 million litres of wine. 8 million. Which sounds like a lot. But by 1990, so less than a decade later, that had almost more than quintupled to 39 million litres, so an increase of 39 million litres. Again, sounds like a lot, but by 2007, so about 17 years after that, that number had risen to 805 million litres. So we're going from 8 million in 1981 to 100 times that in 2007 with 805 million litres, so a huge increase in production of Australian wine. Um, that number is a little bit lower today, 
but Australia remains the world's fifth largest exporter of wine by value. So it's still a very, I mean, it's, it's a very, very important wine producing country. So a little bit of background, let's go on to have a look at the regions themselves. This is a map of Australia, as you can see, um, with all of the main wine regions uh, highlighted. Now, as you will immediately notice, almost all viticulture is concentrated in the lower third of the country, and it kind of clings to the coasts. And this is because Australia is a very warm place. And if we went up to, the, say, the Northern Territory or, or Queensland, for instance, it's too warm for vines to grow healthily and to produce good quality wine. So we see most of our viticulture happening in the south. And one of the main reasons for this, apart from being at a lower latitude and therefore further away from the equator where it's a bit cooler, is that we have the influence of the Great Southern Ocean. So Great Southern Ocean comes, lives down here, uh, surrounds Antarctica, and we get lots of cooling influence as a result in Australia. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start over here in Western Australia. We're going to have a look at um, some of the vineyards uh, in and around Perth. Then we're going to go over to the east or the centre uh, to South Australia and talk a little bit about the vineyards you'll find around the city of Adelaide then down to Victoria and the city of Melbourne. And then finally up to New South Wales and we're going to talk about Sydney. And then if we've got enough time, we might have a chat about this bit in the middle where we get lots and lots of wine being produced. So... Let's get started. Um, we're going to move over to the west of Australia. Um, so we've got up here the city of uh, Perth. Here it is. And there are lots of different areas here, but the one I want to talk to you most about is Margaret River, which is right down here, the western most kind of tip of this little area. And as you can see, this is a, a photo taken from some vineyards. You can't see any vineyards in it, but it's, it's from, a, from a winery, uh, Deep Woods Estate. Uh, a lot of the wine growing areas are very, very close to the sea. And so that while, while this region is fairly warm, it benefits from lots of sea breezes. And if I go to the next photo, you can see that actually quite, a, quite often we've got lots of kind of cloud coming over and that keeps the sun off the vines, which helps to slow down the grape ripening process and allow producers to make better balanced wine and ultimately wine with more concentrated flavors and aromas. So the Margaret River specializes in a lot of the same styles of wine as Bordeaux, funnily enough. So we've got lots of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot grape vines being planted in Margaret River. And they're used to produce high quality, full bodied styles of red wine, often aged in oak barrels. So quite similar in the kind of the process from Bordeaux. While red wine is probably most famous, um, being the most famous style being produced in the Margaret River, we've also got lots of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon um, being grown here. And Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, when they're blended together, is often known as a Bordeaux blend. So this is a white wine, uh, often matured and aged in oak barrels. And it's very, it bears very little resemblance to the kind of savvy bee sort of style that you would get from New Zealand, for example, which can be really, really fruity and herbaceous. This is going to be a little bit rounder, a little bit richer in style and more similar to white Bordeaux wines that you'll find in France. And of course, another great variety being planted here is Chardonnay, which is used to make kind of medium bodied to full wines. But Margaret River is so small that it really only focuses on quality. Now, the thing I find most fascinating about Margaret River is uh, its history because it's a very young wine region. So the first vineyard, that was planted here was in 1967. So wine was not being produced here before then. And those vineyards were planted by a, cardi a cardiologist um, called Dr. Tom Cullity. And so he was the kind of pioneer of grape growing and wine making in the Margaret River. And he was followed pretty soon after that by two other doctors, Dr. Kevin Cullen, who founded uh, Cullen Estate, and Dr. Uh, Bill Pannell, who founded Mosswood. So these kind of trio of early pioneers, all from the medical profession, clearly Australia paying its medical professionals really quite well. So they got some money to start vineyards. Um, and so they, they founded these vineyards. And the other really interesting thing that I find about this is that um, the Margaret River, aside from being known for its wine, is also known for surfing. 
So um, the coast of the Margaret River has fantastic surf. And these two kind of industries um, live in symbiosis with one another because there are lots of young, able-bodied people uh, looking for work quite a lot of the year when they're not surfing. And they are perfect for the sort of jobs that you need to do in a vineyard, like harvesting grapes, uh, pruning the vines, doing lots of vineyard work, working in tasting rooms. So these two, uh, these two industries go hand in hand together. Um, this, um, bin, this vineyard here that you can see, this is Luna Estates, another kind of quite prominent producer uh, in the region. So let's move now over to the east. I'm just keeping a very close eye on the time because we've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going over now to, whoops, we're going over now to South Australia. So this is in and around the city of Adelaide, which is right here. Um, and the, as you can, you can see, there's lots of different regions. I can't talk about all of them, but I will highlight some that I think are particularly noteworthy. So the first is the Barossa Valley. And the Barossa Valley is much more what you think of when you think about Australia. It's really quite warm. It can be baking hot, particularly in the summer months. And one of the things that the Barossa Valley is particularly well known for is the unusual concentration of old vines. So and I'm talking, when I say old vines, I'm talking vines that might be up to 80, 100 years old, maybe even a bit older than that. And you can see a great example in this photo here. So as the vine ages, it tends to sort of develop a sort of quite thick, gnarled trunk. And while it will produce fewer grapes, the grapes that the vine does ripen will be incredibly concentrated and can produce some really special wines. Um, one of the reasons why South Australia is able to produce um, grapes from such old vines is because phylloxera, which is a vineyard pest that has devastated vineyards in most of the world at some point or other, has never made it to South Australia. And Australia has very strict biosecurity laws to prevent this, although I think there might be some risk of it spreading more recently. So hopefully there's a way that they can keep phylloxera at bay to preserve these old vines. And some of these vines go back to those original ones planted by European colonists. So there are some vines in the Barossa Valley that were planted in the 1840s. In fact, some of these vines were planted by people who were fleeing Prussia, from fleeing, fleeing religious persecution in Prussia. That's how far back some of these vines go. Um, the style produced, well, what were they mainly growing? They're mainly producing Shiraz, uh, which is a great variety that's also known as Syrah in other countries. And it will make a full bodied, powerful, rich, concentrated, quite alcoholic style of red wine that is superbly age worthy. The next image is from an area called the Adelaide Hills. So just a little bit further south, the Adelaide Hills have quite a lot more altitude. And they also benefit from cooling sea breezes. And that provides an environment that is perfect for making high quality white wines, particularly from Sauvignon Blanc and from Chardonnay. So the Savvy Bee that's made here is not going to be as herbaceous as you might find in places like New Zealand. It's going to be quite a bit more fruity. And the Chardonnay that's produced here in a range of styles from fairly light bodied, fairly fresh, through to quite rich, often with barrel fermentation and aging to add flavors like vanilla and smoke and cedar. And this is one of those regions that disappeared in the early 1900s. So it was planted back when European settlers arrived, but it kind of disappeared in the 1900s and then was reborn in the 1970s. So just before that boom in Australian wine. And then penultimately, we've got the Eden Valley and the Clare Valley. And I'm kind of putting these two together because they're particularly well known for producing one grape variety and that is Riesling. So Riesling, a German uh, grape variety or a grape variety certainly is most famous from, uh, for producing wine from Germany. But the wines produced in the Clare and Eden Valleys with Riesling are absolutely superb. So these regions both benefit from a little bit of altitude that keeps things much cooler. So the Riesling grape is very happy. And they produce a style, a dry style of Riesling. So unlike a lot of the styles that you will find in Germany, it's completely dry. Um, and the wines are known for having quite a distinctive set of aromas. So if you were to age Riesling from the Clare or the Eden Valleys, what you might find in your Riesling are aromas like petrol um, or 
smoke, uh, paraffin wax. Um, some people even describe it as smelling like, you know, the sole of a new trainer, for example. So it's kind of a slightly rubbery, which doesn't sound like it would be very nice, but trust me, uh, they are absolutely exceptional wines and it really works. It's hard to do justice to the wines, but if you do see some aged Australian Riesling, give it a try because it's well worth it. The other interesting thing about Clare Valley is it is in the Clare Valley, so that's up here, that the screw cap revolution was born. So if you have bought Australian wine recently, you may have very well noticed that almost all of them are bottled with screw caps rather than corks, as is much more commonly the case in Europe. And the reason for this is because back when the Australian wine industry was really getting going, they were producing a lot more wine, coincided with a period of growth in the wine industry more generally. And so there was a bit of a shortage of corks and Australian winemakers strongly suspected that what they were receiving were very low quality. So they wanted a solution to that. And the solution they came up with was the Humboldt screw cap. Um, they've done a lot of work with them now and they realized that not only does it remove the risk of things like cork taint, but that wine can age really well under screw cap. And that's why the vast majority of wine in Australia, even fine wines, are bottled under screw cap today. So you've got producers like um, uh, Jeffrey Grosset, for example, in the 2000s that put a lot of time, effort um, and energy into promoting screw caps more generally. But enough about wine closures. Let's go down to the southeastern corner of the state, um, of the province. And this is Kunawara. And Kunawara is a tiny, tiny little region, but it's quite important. Um, and it's quite important for producing uh, a very unique style of Cabernet Sauvignon. So one of the reasons why it produces such a distinctive style of Cabernet are its soils. So the region itself is based on this strip of terra rossa soils, so red soils. And it's red because these soils are quite rich in iron. And when the iron oxidizes, it produces this reddish orangey kind of color. And lying beneath those iron oxide soils is lots of limestone. And as a result of this limestone, it encourages the vines to develop and retain acidity in their wines um, and slow down the ripening process. As a result, we get a style of fairly balanced, fairly easygoing Cabernet Sauvignon um, that's not going to be overly alcoholic or overly powerful. It's going to be yeah, really well balanced. And one of the interesting things about the styles of, of, of Cabernet produced here, and there's a little bit of Shiraz grown as well, to be fair, is that they often are said to have a very distinct eucalyptus flavor to them. Um, and this was so distinctive that producers in the region kind of banded together to investigate why this was the case. Because so what they had noticed was that there were lots of eucalyptus bushes growing in and around the vineyards. And so when they tested these uh, these vines and the grit and the wine that had been made with these grapes, what they found was elements or traces of eucalyptus in the wines themselves. So what had been happening was that kind of volatile oils from the plants were being carried over by the wind, deposited on the grapes, and then ending up in the final wine itself, uh, resulting in this style that's kind of quite herbal, quite minty, and smells a lot like eucalyptus. So if you like eucalyptus, Definitely a good one to watch out for. If you don't, maybe best to avoid. Right, moving swiftly on. Um, let's continue uh, down to Victoria. Again, loads of different wine regions to look at, but I want to draw your attention to two in particular. And those are the Yarra Valley, which is just outside of Melbourne, and the Mornington Peninsula. So these two wine regions are mainland Australia's coolest wine growing areas. And the main reason for that is not only because they're really far south for mainland Australia, so they're as far away from the equator as you can get without leaving that main kind of continent, but uh, they also are subjected to quite powerful, in, uh, quite powerful influence from the sea. So in the Mornington Peninsula, for instance, uh, wind and rain is actually a challenge for producers. It's a little bit too much in some cases. Um, and I think if I go to the next slide, there we go. This is uh, these are some vines, and you can just see the sea there. 
on the on the horizon. So you get an idea of how close these vineyards are. Both the Yarra and the Mornington Peninsula are best known for high quality Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and they're often said to be producing wine that is of such quality that it rivals Burgundy. And this is actually nothing new. So while I was doing a bit of research for this webinar, I came across a fantastic um, book uh, written by someone called W.S. Benwell. And this book was written in the 1960s. And I'm going to read you a short passage from, from um, W.S. Benwell's uh, book. And in this passage, he describes going out hunting um, one evening in the uh, in Victoria. And well, I'll, I'll, I'll let, the, I'll let the, the writing speak for itself. One evening, after a long day in the saddle, a servant announced that there was no more Pommard left. Now, Pommard is a village in Burgundy, very famous for producing Pinot Noir, so no more Pommard left. Cries of consternation arose from the thirsty hunters, but the servant, who had worked on one of the first Ryrie vine plantings, appeared with a large china jug containing some of Ryrie's rind. It was poured, and the party drank up. Better than Pommard, the guest declared. If this was the sort of wine that could be made right under our feet, then who cared about what came from Burgundy at the other end of the earth? So the Ryrie brothers that are, the Ryrie vines that are referred to um, planted by the Ryrie brothers, who were two Scots, and they founded a producer called Yering Station that is still in the Yarra Valley producing wine to this day. That's all the way back in the 1960s. So quality wine coming up from Australia is very much nothing new. Right, moving very swiftly on. And finally, we're going to talk about the Hunter Valley, which is right up here, just outside of Sydney. And the reason I want to talk about the Hunter Valley very briefly is despite the fact that it's quite a warm and humid place, it's really well known for a distinctive style of, of, of wine made from semium. Semillon is a great variety I mentioned earlier. And what they do is they pick the, the grapes early. So it's got very low level of alcohol. It doesn't taste like very much, but they age it for many, many years, often in bottle. And when it's got a little bit of age on it, it produces some really interesting styles of wine. So it's very unusual. You don't see a lot of it in the UK, um, but you may see, or, or even outside of Australia in general, but if you do spot it, I would highly recommend giving it a try because it's quite unusual. And finally, just in a couple of minutes before I do some questions, um, there is a large region that produces wine right in the middle of southeastern Australia. So there's a big river basin here. And this is home to three different regions, um, the Murray-Darling, Riverina and the Riverland. So we go to the next map. And, oh, here we go. So here's a great photo of what this looks like. This is actually the Riverland specifically. And between these three regions in this big river basin, there are 40% of Australia's vineyards. And this is really home to the big brands. So people like Yellowtail or De Bortoli, for example, those big brands that did a lot of work to um, really promote Australian wine all the way back in the 1980s and are very famous as a result. Uh, it's hot, it's dry, and you need irrigation in order to grow grapes properly here. Um, you've got lots of Chardonnay, lots of Shiraz, and lots of Cabernet Sauvignon planted, but some growers are struggling because while irrigation is very widely used, and here's an example of what those irrigation systems look like, there's less and less water available because it is drier, because it is um, because it's drier and because it's warmer for longer. So a lot of growers in this region, what they call the heartland regions, are looking for alternative grape varieties and particularly grapes from places like Italy and Greece. So you're seeing grapes like Montepulciano, Vermentino, Nero Davila and Assertico being planted throughout Australia in an attempt to forestall um, the effects of climate change or at least to adapt to those um, impacts that could potentially threaten the viability of winemaking without these changes. So that is a whistle-stop tour of Australia. Thank you all for, for joining along. And I think we've got some questions here. Um, so uh, I've got a question here from um, 
Mukonzani, and uh, are wine producers in Australia worried about climate change and how it affects yields? Yes, absolutely they are. Now, I've just spoken about it at the end with regards to the kind of the Murray-Darling, Riverland and Riverina, but it's definitely the case that all over Australia, they are very worried, um, particularly about the fact that we've got much more variable weather. So it's not just the fact that the climate is getting warmer, but the weather itself is becoming more unpredictable. And for example, in, in years um, recently, there have been big problems with things like bushfires, for example, which can damage um, the vineyard quite significantly. Um, what else do we have here in terms of questions? Um, am I just making sure my screen share didn't drop there? Hopefully it didn't, okay. Um, any other questions, guys? I'm just seeing a few come through now. Um, can you describe Australian exports of wine? Is it more, more for the domestic market, European or other regions? So um, the two largest export markets for Australian wine are the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, so they take, uh, I think, about 20% of exports roughly a piece, although it might be a little bit higher, a bit lower. And then following behind Singapore and Hong Kong. So um, quite a variety of different places, Singapore and Hong Kong being quite uh, close geographically, although they have had big problems with um, tariffs being placed on their wine in mainland China. So that's been a big problem for lots of producers. Um, and I've had a, a comment here from Maria Lorena Lopez, um, say something about Tasmania. Um, Tasmania is fantastic. So Tasmania, that island, is just at the very southern uh, tip of um, Australia. And uh, I would have loved to have included a main presentation, but there's so much to talk about. It is a very, very cool wine growing region and it specializes in the production of traditional methods, sparkling wines. So made in the same style as uh, champagnes of exceptionally high quality. So there are fan some fantastic Tasmanian sparkling wines. I think they're doing a little bit of still wine as well, but the sparkling is very much their um, main focus. Um, Loic is asking, are there similar Shiraz blends like in France? Yes. So as you would find in the Southern Rhone Valley, for example, um, we have Shiraz being blended with grapes like Grenache and Mouved, or which is also known as Mataro in Australia. So these produce really full bodied wines in a similar style to things like Chateauneuf de Pape, for instance. Right. Lots of questions coming through now. I'll do what I can to um, answer some of these. Uh, if I was to buy one white and one red, it's quintessentially Australian. What should I go for? Um, I'm sorry, Catherine. I'm unfortunately I'm going to dodge that question because there is such a range of styles being produced within Australia. Um, but certainly, you know, look for really unique styles, things like Clare Valley Riesling or Hunter Valley Semillon for your white wines. And then if you can, maybe something like a Barossa Valley Shiraz or um, a, a Yarra Valley Pinot Noir. I mean, those are such different red wines that I don't think you could get quintessential in just one bottle. But that's great because you get to explore in more detail. Okay. Um, how will Australia replace sales lost to China? That's a great question. So one of the things that they're doing is focusing more on high quality wines um, rather than the high volume um, wines that were being produced in the past. So that amount um, the, of wine that is being exported from Australia is going down, but the value is uh, very much holding steady. And so while Australia exports by volume only the 10th largest amount of wine by value is the fifth largest uh, wine exporter. So quite a difference um, there. Okay. And time, I think, for just one more question. Um, let's have a quick look here. Uh, Pinot Noir, is production increasing? What are the best regions? So I'm not sure about the overall statistics for Pinot Noir production. Um, however, the best wine regions, Mornington Peninsula and the Yarra Valley in particular. So that is just about everything for today. Thank you very much. My name's been Sam Povey. You can find me on Instagram at sampovey.wine. Uh, a feedback call has just been launched. So um, if you have any feedback for myself, please do leave it there. That'd be really helpful. If you've signed up, you'll be emailed a recording of this session. And um, if you've enjoyed it, please come back. We've got some more sessions coming up. On the 31st of October, we're looking at the UK, um, and particularly England's main wine regions. On the 14th of November, we're looking at Argentina. And then on the 23rd of January, we'll be looking at 
Greece. So lots more to come. Hope to see you there and have a lovely evening, everyone. Cheers. And uh, yeah, I've only got water here, but speak to you soon.